Um, I'm going to start out with the fact that there seems to be some confusion about this room. Um, we are right after lunch, and I'm talking about documentation. So this is not actually the official nap room. So if you think that you're going to be sleeping in this presentation, you may want to go and find a new room now. Um, that's uh, public service announcement number one. Public service announcement number two is, um, I always like to do this because I recognize so many faces here. How many people have actually seen me speak before? Sober. Okay, excellent. It's the same number of hands. <laughs> so um, I'm going to get started. There's still a few sort of people dribbling in, and um, the, the excitement for today will be to see if my waistband on my skirt can hold the, uh, the mic pack for the entire talk. So if you find that I'm suddenly sort of lowering my hemline, if you could just let me know so I can hike it back up again, I'd appreciate it very much. Um, so it, the, um, the talk that I proposed back in, wow, when did we send these proposals in? Like September, no, before September. We found out in September if we were accepted or not. So it was, it was like July, I think, that I first submitted this talk. And the, the really awesome thing for me is that I got a job between when I first submitted the talk and now. So when I said in the description that this would be a case study, um, it is still a case study. It just happens to be my actual job now. Um, I work for StatusNet. Um, my name's Emma. I talk about really awesome stuff like version control. Woo! And documentation. Also, woo! Yeah, everyone's like, so in the wrong room. Okay. So, <laughs> if you missed the bizarre talk, it was recorded. If you'd like to know about that as well, I do have to use Git for this project. And as you may know, Git makes me angry inside. So here we go. <laughs> Um, I'll be talking about uh, StatusNet, which is the platform that runs Identica. How many people do not have an Identica account? Okay, so task number one, go to Identica and create an account because you've got some homework during this presentation. So I want eyes on keyboards. Away you go, identica.ca, Identica, and you're going to create an account. Uh, you can use it to push to Twitter, that other messaging platform you may have heard of. It kind of lags a little bit because we have had some XMPP queuing issues, which we always take care of, which we always take care of as soon as we know about. Yes, question already. So as I mentioned before, StatusNet is the platform that Identica runs on. So StatusNet is the software and also the parent company. Identica is an instance of StatusNet. So if I change to the next slide, you'll see that StatusNet also powers other websites. This is the, the Twit Army, so twit.tv twit um, also runs a StatusNet instance. You may have also read about the fact that Motorola implemented uh, StatusNet. Um, it may have been called Laconica at the time, which is the former, um, the former name that we were using, but StatusNet is way more sexy, so we're using that now. And in a short while, I won't say the date because I am actually not entirely sure when the date is. You know, it'll launch when it's ready. Uh, you will be able to have your own StatusNet instance. So the way that Twit TV, so they are army.twit.tv, we will be offering a hosted solution, which is uh, yourname.status.net. So this happens to be my... Uh, <laughs> My, my, it doesn't do very much right now, instance. So this is emma.status.net. Um, we have uh, the people who are interested in it are either uh, open source communities who want to have the discussion happening in a filtered, i.e. Um, community space, and also uh, companies who are interested in putting a micro-messaging system behind the firewall. So Motorola's example is a, a corporate intranet instance of the StatusNet platform. Uh, so there's uh, open source, it's uh, AGPL, works with fun things like LDAP, um, blah, 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 technical specifications, not really part of this conversation. But if you want to know more about it, by all means, come and corner me later, or uh, John Phillips is running around the conference as well. John's a great one to corner, bald guy with a beard. I know that really narrows it down. Um, <laughs> Uh, with a, ooh, if I turn my head, I get really loud, with a status net business card that identifies him. Um, and he is signing people up for this, the beta release of the status net platform, and he'd love to talk to you more as well. 
So that's my long-winded introduction. Now we get on to the really fun stuff. So um, documentation doesn't actually need to be ugly. Uh, I wish that we could dim these front lights so that you could see these shoes. Um, typically, the response to these shoes is some going, they're awesome. They've got rhinestones. I don't think I'm, yeah, I, my laser pointer, oh, there we go. I don't know if you can even see that little dot there. And then most of the other, typically the minority of the, the room, typically the females are going, that's disgusting. You actually wore those. So documentation, thank you very much for dimming the lights. There we go. Documentation doesn't have to be ugly, although it is very much a perception thing. And more specifically, we can make documentation hurt less. So how many people in the room love writing documentation? Yeah! Three of you. I want you for my team. <laughs> and how many people are like, yeah, I have to do it. My boss makes me. And how many people are like, screw that, I volunteer, I don't write documentation. Okay, why are you in this room? This is awesome, okay. <laughs> no, 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 I don't, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> so, um, I know that you all went and did your, your, the first step of your homework, which was to create an Identica account, if you didn't already have one. And here's the next, oh, there we go. Here's the next part of the homework. As we go through this presentation, if, um, as you start getting uh, into Identica, if there's points that you realize you really wish you had a little bit more documentation at that point. So not support requests, but pain points. One of the ways that I'm collecting information about the system in order to find out what needs documentation is to ask people to tell me what the pain points are. And we'll see how this fits into the framework a little bit later. I'm not going to go backwards one slide. So the talk is um, four part. We'll look at types of documentation. We'll look at types of readers and then uh, the framework that I'll be using for StatusNet to build a new documentation slash user help system for our 1.0 release. This whole talk, the slides are available already on slideshare.net, and I'll have the URL at the end. This, this documentation also has a white paper associated with it, so by all means keep notes if that's of interest to you, but it the talk on documentation has already been documented. I know this is going to be shocking for some of you. All right, so here we go. Pain points. The first thing that I've got here is a type of documentation. It's after lunch, so everyone's feeling kind of dozy. But what are some of the types of documentation that you can think of? And of course, the recording won't get this. and I do not expect the microphones to come around and record your one instance of documentation. But... What are some of the things that you can think of? Glossary. glossary. Wow. And then crickets after glossary. You only know one type of documentation. Config, videos, screenshots. There was something at the back. FAQs, API reference, encyclopedia. Did I hear that? Yeah. What else? Walkthroughs. Anything else? Cheat sheet if I actually turn the page. Good, good. So there's lots of different kinds of documentation, right? So um, I'm assuming that most of these will at least sound familiar. Uh, does anyone want more description of something that's on here? Yep. A self-help guide. Yeah. Yeah. So. So a self-help guide is, um, essentially it's all about me, as opposed to being all about, ooh, where should we put it in here? Cookbooks and how-tos are all about the person who wrote the documentation, typically all about the person who wrote the documentation and the steps they needed to accomplish to achieve a specific thing on their often very esoteric system. So how to install um, Identica 0.9 release candidate 2 on Fedora that doesn't have access to, like it's just often these really, really specific things. Whereas self-help guides, I like to think of as being really user-centric. So we take a look at all of the things that users want to accomplish, and then we start to generalize. And we say, okay, well, what are the tasks? How can we write this in a way that it applies to lots of people, as opposed to what we often see in those how-tos and cookbooks, 
that are so specific that they become out of date really quickly and they just don't apply to so many people. And we certainly see in the, um, in the IRC channel for StatusNet, people who are like, so I followed this thing and I installed all the packages and we're like, what do you mean all the packages? There's like two things you need to install. And they've read some how-to somewhere where someone couldn't figure it out, so they just kept installing more and more packages, and it, it didn't, it failed. You know, pound fail, right? So, these are different types of documentation. Um, we will end up having almost all of this in our documentation framework, but we'll be approaching it from different, um, diff well, well, we'll use different strategies with each of these different kinds of documentation. So now we've got types of readers. Uh, what kinds of readers, so I talked a little bit about it being me-centered. What are some of the roles that you have as users when you're using your system? So there's a different kind of manual for newbies. Yep, who else? Administrator, absolutely. Hackers, yep, yep. I think I only have three, so I'm going to change to the next one. Don't I have another, do I have another one there? Oh, marketing people. Oh, marketing wonks. Who writes for marketing wonks? So, yeah, okay, there's one person up the back. I write for marketing wonks. So it's really important to actually have a way to convince people that they want to use your system. So when I asked the room, how many people have an identity account, uh, identi do not have an identity account, and about two-thirds of the room put up their hand, in my mind, that's a failure to document at the marketing level. So we've not done a good job because someone's shown up on the front page and went, eh, I don't know what this is, and left. Right? There wasn't sufficient information to actually convince someone to show them the features and benefits, which really don't need to be in a how-to or a cookbook. So it's at the marketing level. It's pre-user, shall we say. Uh, this is also the information that you would give to your boss to convince them that you actually should be uh, implementing this internally. So there's a types of readers. We have types of documentation. Framework. Um, I picked ponies because I'm from the country and I like ponies. And framework also kind of, it sort of works because it has the whole cart and horse analogy and it has the whole... Um, if you're, we'll see that it's a cycle, the framework is a cycle that we're going to work with. If your cycle falls apart at any phase, it makes the horse really unhappy. So whether you want to think of the horse as being your users or your developers, either way, it makes the horse really unhappy and the jockey gets kicked in the face. So, you know, a little bit of failure. So if we want to think of this wheel analogy as we move through the framework description, keep in mind that there's different kinds of frameworks that are going to work in different instances. The wheel that you want to put on a... Uh, I always get them confused. Some, some trotters go this way, pacers go this way. I think that's a pacer. So the framework that you use for this versus the Clydesdale, the beer, I don't, maybe, I don't know if that actually works, analogy works in New Zealand. Anyways, the big beer trucks, slightly different. But either way, you need that wheel to work for your documentation to stay uh, complete and correct. So here we go. Here's our framework. I'm going to spend the next chunk of this talk going through the framework. Uh, if you were at Lana's presentation on Monday, this is very similar to what... She, is Lana here? No. <gasps> Just kidding. Um, this is very similar to the, the framework that she described except hers was um, a more linear one. I've just bent the tail and brought it round. So we've got capture, organize, translate, output, review, and revise. And um, often documentation dies at the, well, just about every single phase, doesn't it? Okay, so let's take a look at how we can get this loop rolling and we can actually get our ponies moving along in a productive way. Again, this is a status net. Uh, this is how it's going to work over the next couple of months as I set up the framework for the documentation. <laughs> for those of you who know Identica, uh, it's 140 characters at a time. What could there possibly be to document? Right? Yeah, well, here's our support forum. The support forum 
this is uh, two day, not even two days worth of support questions. We also have people who send support requests to at support, and we've got a dev mailing list. And so on the one hand, it's 140 characters. On the other hand, we do have a lot of pain points. Most of these exist at the system administration level, um, so trying to get the actual code base up and running. But we've also had some people say, well, I don't know, like, is it a dent, a tweet? A, like, what is this thing? What am I supposed to put in this box? They may understand how Facebook works because they already, they can watch their friends interacting, but if they're completely new to it, there's not the same conversations as you would see on a Facebook wall. So some of the questions that we get are at the, the sort of marketing features and benefit area. So this is why we need the documentation. Like most documentation projects, when I started on this one, ours was out of date, incomplete, hard to maintain, and painful. Um, kind of like a blister. And you have to put your shoes on every day because you're the ones that are, you know, you're watching the mailing list go by. You are, maybe you're the person who's actually trying to, to install the software and it makes absolutely no sense to you. When <laughs> software can be really awesome, but if you can't actually get people using it or you have really awesome documentation and they can't find the documentation, you're going to end up with this kind of experience. So this is the, the list of ways that we're going to try and help users. We are going to have um, the code base and functions documented. We're going to have a community wiki. We're going to have API documentation, which is kind of like the code base documentation, but we also have functions which, um, or sorry, we have functionality which does not exactly map onto the functions that are available. So our API does not have a one-to-one -one correlation with the, uh, the functions that are in our code base. So we're going to have a separate level of documentation for that. We're going to have a developer manual, an administrator manual, a user manual. Developer manual is also the hacker manual, right? User manual, online help, uh, on or inline help, so the actual within the interface on the website when you click for help. Uh, Plug-in help and also internationalization. Awesome, right? How many people want to cry right about now? That's a heck of a lot of documentation that I have 100 hours. There's no way that I'm going to be able to do all of that stuff in 100 hours. So this is where the community part really comes in. As, and as is true of every open source project. I've got my first yawner, so you I'll have my first sleeper. All right, here we go. So challenges. This is where I actually flip over to my little cue cards. Some of the challenges that we have uh, include the fact that we don't have a culture of documentation. How many open source projects do have a culture of documentation? Okay. The one who likes to write for marketers has a culture of documentation. No one else. That means that I have no documentation teams here. I have, how many developers do I have? How many, what would you describe yourself as if you're not a developer? Sysadmin, yeah. Sysadmin, okay. So sysadmins and developers apparently don't have a culture of documentation. And our team is comprised of, surprise, surprise, we have an ops and a dev team. That's it. <laughs> we have only system administrators and developers. So one of our big challenges is going to be to figure out how to instill that culture of documentation. The Drupal project has done a fabulous job with this. They have insisted that for any patch which is going to be landed, it must come with corresponding documentation. A patch is not complete until the code is documented and the handbook is updated. Full stop. It's not done until that's done. Um, and I think it's ultimately the only way to, to force that culture to actually, you don't have to love it, you just have to document it. Um, we need to make things useful and we also need to put that documentation where our sysadmins and our programmers are already working. So if it's um, in a wiki, everyone loves to document in a wiki, you've got a context change. You've got a programmer who has to go from, whether it's Vim or Emacs or Eclipse or whatever their development environment is, they have to open up a web browser to document what they were doing. It's too far away. So one of the challenges is to move as much of that document, second yawner, as much of our documentation 
into the code base or where people are working. That also means that for the users, we need to keep it out of the code base where it's relevant to do so. So we need to have a wiki for the users who want to document their experience. Uh, single source. <laughs> right now we have two wikis, a forum, an internal instance of StatusNet, pain points on Identica. I'm going to run out of things. So I think I listed about four or five or six things there. That's a lot of different places where users have to go. Oh, and also the internet. You may have heard of it. So users can also find information on blog posts, on, on all kinds of things. So we've got this, this huge spread of information, which there's no way to keep it up to date. So we need to bring it into a single source for our official documentation. Uh, we need to automate where possible and um, also not forget to update our marketing website which is the documentation for the pre-users of our system. So, who writes it? Well, in many cases, there is no writer. So we need to make sure that we've got actual documentation happening at all of these phases to ensure that the framework actually works, to ensure that that wheel keeps going and that the documentation stays up to date and uh, correct, it's clear, it is ultimately user-centric. So. Here's the plan. Um, I'm going to let you sort of scan through this list. The, the highlighted words, which I think should show up, are ultimately different parts of the framework. So just sort of scanning down. Machine readable format, I don't actually care if it's XML or not. That's just my sort of uh, shorthand. I had someone, the last time I gave this presentation, wag their finger at me and, REST is a machine readable format. Yes, yes it is. Uh, but I'm probably going to be working in DocBook because I know the tool chain better. Um, so scraped and pushed, uh, probably using Doxygen for code documentation, translation of documentation. Yay, how many people want to translate documentation? One, right? Translation is brutally hard. And so, well, translation itself probably isn't that hard. Translation itself is a bit of an art. But setting up the framework to make it easy for people who know multiple languages, that part is brutally hard. And I don't know, I don't know of a single project that has not made at least one translator cry. Real tears, right? So, and it is, it's brutally hard. We're gonna do our best um, to make it a little bit less painful, but we know that it is hard. Uh, again, review and revise, and also we want to be able to help people accomplish specific tasks. So the actual authors, as I mentioned, I've got 100 hours um, and my job is to set up the framework. It's not to write every single piece of documentation, which may be good, may be bad, but I think that what it will do is really allow the project to push for a culture of documentation and translation and community-driven information as opposed to a single person being responsible for everything and not being able to keep track of all the different experiences that need to be documented. So I mentioned before, um, I want to try and get more of a culture of devs putting documentation into the code base. Uh, uh, Brian Bibber is our new system, senior system architect, came from MediaWiki, fabulous guy. Uh, I'm, every other project out there should be jealous that we now have him. Or just come and work with us, because you know, that's cool too. Um, <laughs> feature lists, which is essentially our marketing speak, that can be pulled from the release notes. So in that case, the, um, again, the devs are going to be responsible for creating the feature list, and then we'll have someone to put some marketing polish around them. Point of need, this is going to be more someone like me. So instead of writing, who said FAQs earlier? FAQs? So instead of having FAQs, what I want to have are FATs. So frequently asked tasks, as opposed to frequently asked questions. So again, it's coming back to what are the things that I want to accomplish as opposed to just having the common questions that people are asking. The questions may or may not have uh, the right direction for the solution, but if it's task-oriented, we can put those tasks where, like the, you know, the instruction sheets in the, the IKEA box or the, the, uh, the assembly box. We can actually put the instructions where they're needed as opposed to a huge FAQ that gets kind of out of control and there's nowhere to put it because it has it's not sorted enough. So I want to look at FATs. 
Um, and then also the community update. So we'll continue to have people who write blog posts or they contribute into the wiki. So framework. There's a lot of different people that I just mentioned there. So again, if these wheels are falling off, it's not just one pony that's getting upset. This is now lots of ponies and lots of people who are getting kicked in the face. So let's take a look at how this framework is going to work. Starting with capture. Not surprisingly, this is the brainstorming phase. Um, if I, there we go, capture. So this is where you run around and you collect all of the things that need to be documented. And this is related to the, uh, the tasks that people need to accomplish. This is the pain points that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. This is uh, trolling the forums, asking the support team, what are the common questions that people get. This is figuring out what do we actually need to document. We probably excuse me, we probably don't need to document to send out a status update, type into the box and click send. Like, probably we don't need to document that. And yet, there's this sort of tendency to document the easy things because they're, it's low-hanging fruit to talk about the things you know how to do. So in the capture phase, I want to th find all the things that are hard. That's going to be our big goal for it. Um, once or as we start to capture, we move on as well to the next phase, which is organization. So once we've got into our organization phase, these are small ants that have been classified according to things that one sorts ants by. Uh, <laughs> right? So the classification system will include things like the types of users. Um, at what point is this information actually needed? Is this something that needs to go into a linear user manual? Because when we show up at, at enterprising meetings, we have to be able to go third yonder. Uh, we need to be able to put down that user manual and say, look, we have documentation. Or is this something that also, and or, needs to be placed somewhere in the system um, because we know where this frequently asked about task actually exists? So we know everything we're going to document. The next thing we need to do is we need to organize it, right? Second part of that framework. Um, I have a note to say here again, emphasize the importance of the culture of documentation. I don't think I can say that enough. So just like put that on loop as a pro, you know, sort of a, what's the background process, right? Just pretend that I say this on every single slide. Here we go. Next part is to translate. Translation has a picture. I don't know if it's ASL or BSL or whatever SL it is, but it was the only thing I could think of that actually sort of suggested active translation uh, or interpretation in this case. Translation needs to happen when things are at the machine readable phase. So in the, uh, the organized part, that's also where we start to add that machine readable language. We need, we need to start adding semantic value to our information. We need to tag things according to role. Is this an administered fourth yawner? I'm doing awesome. <laughs> Is this question? Yes. I can repeat it as well. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the, the question is, is this really the best phase to have translation happen? The answer is 100% absolutely yes, 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 yes. And the reason why is because when it's in a machine-readable state, you can actually pull or push it out to a, uh, a translation interface and then pull it back in. And then we'll go, when we go to the next step, which is output, you can actually have all of your PDFs look the same, right? Or you can have all of your documentation look the same. So at this point, uh, for the translation, uh, sorry, the translation of the GUI interface, so the fact that it says account or login or those kinds of strings, at this point we're pushing to translate wiki. And so there, it has to be in a machine readable format because we need to push it out to a system, have it translated in a web interface, and then pull it back in. For uh, longer documentation, if you're looking at essentially user manuals that happen in DocBook or that kind of thing, we may push to floss manuals, which will take, go from uh, DocBook into, again, a wiki editor and then back to DocBook. Uh, so there's, 
the important part of it, though, is the fact that you can push out to whatever interface a translator is most comfortable and then pull it back in and then have uh, pushing out to consistent documentation um, visually. So let's say, let's pretend I'm from Canada. We need to have French and English documentation. The translation teams, well, <laughs> hopefully we don't need to translate English to English, but sometimes that happens. Um, different teams may have different tools that they want to use to translate. If it's not in a machine-readable format, it becomes much more difficult to keep the documentation consistent. You also end up with a very likely chance of having language forks. So Drupal.org uh, was not easily translated, and now there are as many versions of Drupal.org as there are translation teams. Because they weren't able to do it in one centralized place, that means that if you're looking to do something in Dutch, you may or may not find the same set of instructions that are available in Chinese or English. And again, that's why we're trying to do this at the machine phase so we can push out and pull back into our official documentation. Great question, though. Any other questions at this point? So what about double translation if you're going to German and then back to English? So, yeah. Um, at this point, if we actually have a problem where the translators get really excited and start producing more documentation, I will be thrilled because number one, how many translators exist in the open source community? And number two, um, how many of them already know about Identica and care enough to write documentation as well? This is again setting up a framework so that it exists so that someone, when someone does come to us and says, hey, we'd really like to translate your work, we have a framework set up and we can instantly push out to some kind of translation system. Do I expect there to be translations for the 1.0 release? Not really. Okay, big secret though. So, but we wanna have the framework set up and if there's someone here, I mean, like, is there anyone here, there was one translator who wants to translate documentation for us? No, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but it is something that we want to be prepared for. And especially because we're going into um, enterprise situations like Motorola, we expect that there will be some translation of the documentation done. We also need to be able to accept those translations back in, um, especially when they're coming from downstream vendor relationshipy things that would be nice to receive information back from them. Uh, so at this point, the source material for the user manuals or the manual things, uh, that will be in a Git um, source code repository thing with docbook and lots of nastiness. And it's not that we're trying to prevent people from participating in uh, writing and producing documentation and translating. It's that when we push to output, what we're going to do is we're going to push to many different kinds of uh, format. So we will have uh, HTML, which is actually going to live in a wiki. That means that if you want to edit the documentation, you go right ahead and you bang on the official documentation and you edit it. Because come uh, the 2.0 release, we're going to take a look at how the documentation has changed. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we're going to output to multiple different formats. Uh, we need to build a brand documentation. So we'll push it out with the StatusNet logo if Twit decides that if Twit TV decides they want their logo on it, great. We swap it in on our uh, XSLT style sheets and all of a sudden we've got completely newly branded documentation. Uh, in theory, we may want to be able to actually print this stuff. So having PDF to a print-on-demand company like Lulu or something like that, again, gives us a lot more flexibility if we push to multiple formats. The next Part of it is to actually review what happens to our documentation. As I mentioned, we're pushing that documentation to a wiki. We're going to let people go ahead and bang on the official documentation because in, oh, I have a pretty picture for that one. Oh, review, look at that, awesome. Um, in the review phase, we're actually going to look for things like, wow, there's suddenly 15 pages of documentation on how to do this one specific task that we thought was trivial. Maybe we need to go back and take a look at our user interface. Maybe our user interface really blows there, and that's why our documentation has suddenly blown out of proportion. So that's what we're going to do on every full number release, is we're going to have someone essentially go through and garden the documentation, 
make UI suggestions, and it doesn't have to happen on every full release, but I mean, it, it, um, it will happen at a minimum on every full release. So we're going to take a look at how we can actually improve the system. Once the system is improved, we can prune the documentation back. In other words, we can do the final part of our framework. We can do revisions. So of course, there will be new features and new things that need to be described in our documentation between releases. But we're also going to go through and, and figure out what the community has said about our system, and therefore, what do we need to fix. And that completes that full circle, right? the full framework. Um, on the revised phase, this is also essentially where we end up doing mini loops inside. So if we've got other people who've translated, if things have happened on their wiki, so we were talking about the, the double translation, if there's new content suddenly available, we'll pull that back into what will start as an English and then get translated out to multiple versions. Um, and that's, I mean, I hate to say that's pretty much it, but that's the framework, right? So let's look at those steps again. We had capture the brainstorming phase, organize. This is where things are tagged according to role and task. And also um, uh, machine readable, put into a machine readable state. Translation, language variants, output. So pushing out to PDF, community editable versions, uh, print if they want it. Review, look and see what's happened to our documentation. Look and see where we can actually make improvements to the software to reduce the amount of documentation. And finally, revise to actually make those changes and start the cycle again. And I mean, I hate to say it sounds trivial, right? But it's just at this point, what was the, Paul, what was your, it was a simple matter of code. This is a simple matter of documentation, <laughs> right? So that's the framework that we'll be using. Um, that pretty much sums it up as far as I'm concerned. The, the strategy, as I mentioned, is that second to last line if you want to see this talk as an actual white paper of what we'll be doing. And most importantly is to tell me about your pain points. So when you all created your Identica account at the very beginning of this talk, there may have been things that didn't make sense. Maybe the fact that clicking on the logo didn't behave the same way as Twitter, Twitter was really confusing. And did you need it documented? Maybe, maybe not. So tell me about it, whether you um, are within Identica and you're tagging things as pain points or just adding them to the wiki. And of course, if you would like to contribute to the documentation, I would love to have you. Um, I'm going to be kicking around afterwards. And today, yes, today, I will be banging out um, what we currently have on the pain points page into uh, roles and tasks. And if you want to help with that, I, again, would love to have your participation. You don't need to have experience with Identica. In fact, it's probably better if you don't, um, because you can tell me about the things that you've had problems with. I've got one question in the middle and probably about five minutes left. Oh, is that? Oh, don't tell me the pain point. Document the pain point. <laughs> so I have a memory like a sieve, which is why I write all this stuff down. Is that me that's tapping? OK. Are you on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I have 100 hours to work on this. I'm setting up the framework primarily. And the, the, um, so the question was, where do you actually do user testing? And ultimately, user testing happens at all phases, absolutely happens at all phases. Um, and uh, to a large degree, it is an open source project. And we need the community to tell us if that documentation is correct and complete. Um, I have, as part of my 100 hours, um, three levels of user testing that will happen with documentation. And also the fact that um, by asking people to contribute pain points, it means that I can come back to the community and say, you identified a pain point. Do you feel that this has now been accurately represented in the documentation in a location that makes sense to you? And does it work for you? Um, my guess is that if I suddenly start producing documentation based on the current state of the documentation, it will get tested immediately. 
because there's such a huge need for it. It's such a mess right now. And that's not, it's not anyone's fault that it's a mess. It's just a typical open source project. Uh, question in the middle. Yep. Yeah, I've got a question for Ooh, you. You've got a microphone, uh, too. Yeah, look at that. Um, one thing that's uh, been biting us a pain point for our documentation project is where we have a sort of a synchronization problem. Uh, we have different manuals in different places, and of course, if you have a central location, yep. you can keep them all synchronized, but yep. then what happens is you have similar ideas being addressed in different ways in different areas, and if you want to change that idea, you have to touch, you know, who knows as many problems. And it's a, it's a programming problem also for, about modularity, you know. Yep. But how do you resolve that? Um, with diligence. I mean, I, it's, it's kind of a, I, we got to make up our own, well, I shouldn't say we all got to make up our own titles, but I, was a, I got to pick the title that I um, had with, with StatusNet. And I, I, it currently says um, documentation strategist on my business card, but there are many, many times that I feel that that should actually be user help advocate or um, content strategist or something else, because a lot of what I'm doing is going around and finding all of the places that people leave little breadcrumbs of information. And I think that there's, uh, in the years that I've been doing this kind of thing, and this goes way back to, I mean, I was, um, I was a sort of upper level person with the Linux documentation project in 2003, 2004. Um, so I've certainly, I mean, I've, I've spent my time in the trenches, and I've not seen any machine tool that can do that. I mean, it's a matter of, of looking at all of the information that your project outputs, going and, and putting on, um, I mean, not to, <laughs> sorry, you'll understand why I'm pausing in half a second. I have Google Alerts, not that using proprietary software is necessarily a good thing, but, and then I was like, no, because I've got Google at the back, and I love Google, and they funded me to be here, so. <laughs> okay, um, but put Google Alerts on specific topics that are related to your project. Find the places where people are writing blog posts get them into the documentation, try and centralize that information. And it's, it's bloody hard. And I haven't found a way to make it easier. It just takes a lot of time. Um, and you can have like wikis and knowledge bases and support forums and you have like just gross amounts of places where people can put information. Yeah, it's hard to maintain. So all you developers think you're really clever, we have the hard job. <laughs> Um, Did that answer it? I mean, other than to the fact that I didn't actually answer it? Brute force, absolutely. So, and uh, what you said there, I'm just going to say it back to the camera, was to have more metadata on information. Uh, absolutely. And this is where single sourcing, if, um, if you don't know about the concept, if there's other people who don't know about it, Single sourcing is when you have one huge canonical place for all information to go. It's appropriately tagged and appropriately pushed out. You may have multiple manuals covering multiple roles going out to multiple places, but information gets written down once and only once, and it's in that single sourced place. Uh, questions um, over here? Sorry, up here. Oh, yep. yep. Um, in that framework that you're looking at, obviously sometimes it's important to classify information, uh, whether or not it's pre-release or internal or whatever, especially in case of something like status now, I'm guessing you guys don't want to document your internal instance publicly. Whereabouts in the framework would be the best place to do the classification, do you think? Classification happens at the organization stage. Is that, uh, ooh, I don't know if you can see my little red dot or not, but um, we, uh, so just because of the developers we have, not surprisingly, we have a wiki culture, um, and there is, you know, with, with absolute um, understanding, uh, there's a resistance to wanting to have things put into machine-readable formats. <laughs> Sorry, wikis aren't machine-readable if they're accessed only through a web interface. Um, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see how well we can do that. Fortunately, we have things that are coming up. So for example, one of our sales guys has been looking for things to be answered, and he keeps asking over and over and over again in our internal um, status net deployment, and it keeps not being answered and answered and answered. And I finally said, did you make a wiki page? He was like, oh. And I was like, maybe if you made a wiki page, people would actually put the answer somewhere that you could find instead of allowing that information to flow past. So we're still trying to figure out how that's going to work in terms of what our staff uh, is comfortable doing. Um, 
and how we're going to classify and sort information in terms of, I mean, some of these are, they have to do with enterprise sales questions. They don't belong in our public documentation system. But I would say that 98% of what we do does belong out there. So we're still trying to figure some of that out. Uh, question? Yes. You mentioned compiling DocBook into wiki pages mm -hmm. and then sucking information back from those after they've been edited and putting them back into the system. Do you have a tool that you're using for that, or is that currently a simple matter of code? <laughs> um, I found, I, untested, uh, I found on Google Code uh, an X to Y translator that will do just about any format that you can think of to just about any other format that you can think of. So I hate to say that it's trivial, because that, you know, that ticks me off on the, the developer bingo to say it's trivial, but I also don't want to say it's non-trivial, which is another square on the, the buzzword bingo, because there is actually code available to go, I mean, docbook to HTML, pretty straightforward, HTML to wiki, pretty straightforward, and then it's a question of how much semantic value am I going to put into my docbook and therefore lose on the way out when I pull back in. So, probably what we're going to end up doing is never pulling back in directly because we're going to pull back in as part of the review and revise phase. So someone needs to read all of those changes and we don't necessarily want to accept blankly everything that's going to come from the wiki. Technically though, again, don't want to say it's trivial, but um, in the older version of these slides, I've got a link to it and it's, a, it's on code.google. It will be a matter of doing like docbook HTML something translation and you'll probably find it. I okay, if anybody else wants a few more, uh, ask, ask some more questions. We can probably carry it on outside um, we because we're, more, we're, way, we're way over time. Um, got another group coming in in uh, like about five minutes. So um, if you want to carry this on out in the foyer, that'll be great. Thanks very much. Sorry. <laughs> I have to be, somebody has to be the time Nazi. Um, this is the, the third bottle for Emma Jane. She, I think she's going to host a party. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. I would be glad to talk with you out in the hall.